ICBMs launch from silos in the ground, ballistic missiles launch from submarines underwater, and nuclear weapons delivered by strategic bomber aircraft make up the three prongs of America's nuclear triad. But in the 1970s, none of them were perfect. Land-based ICBMs were made up of Minuteman missiles, which could hit hardened military targets fairly accurately. But they were quite vulnerable to attacks themselves, since they were sitting ducks inside ground silos. Submarines were not as vulnerable due to their stealth. But submarine-launched ballistic missiles were not that accurate at the time, so they could not be used to attack Soviet missile installations. They could only hit cities in case of an all-out war. And the bomber force was simply not a rapid enough retaliatory response when compared to land-based or submarine-launched missiles. The bigger issue, however, was that the Soviets' first strike with just 40% of their ICBMs, as I'll explain in a minute, could successfully destroy the majority of American Minuteman missiles, leaving the US with no retaliation options against hardened Soviet military installations. It was the urgency to address this vulnerability that led to the development of the MX program, also known as the Peacekeeper Missile. But why the US military put ICBMs inside trailers that could plow the ground? Why the newer Peacekeeper missiles were eventually phased out in favor of the older Minuteman missiles? And why the US Air Force was not only in a race against the Soviet Union, but also against the US Navy, is not what you think. For simplicity, let's assume that both Americans and Soviets had 1,000 ICBMs each. You'd think Soviets would have to launch 1,000 missiles to target each of America's 1,000 missile silos, which means even if they were successful, both sides would be left with no ICBMs. That may have been the case in the 1950s, but the Soviet Union of the late 1970s could accomplish this with only 400 missiles or less. That's because they had developed ICBMs like the SS-18, where each missile could accurately deliver not one, but up to 10 warheads. This was accomplished with the help of multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs. These MIRVs could hit within 600 feet of the Minuteman missile silos. And even if it wasn't a direct hit, a nuclear detonation could still shake up the silo and cause debris to fall down, which could further damage the missile. In fact, in order to test such scenarios, a structure of steel and wood was built on top of an actual Minuteman launch facility and was then loaded with high explosives. A layer of soil was then added on top to contain the shock wave. The resulting explosion simulated the overpressure effects of an actual nuclear explosion in order to see how the silos would hold up. But how did the development of the new LGM-118, also known as the Peacekeeper missile, solve these problems? Military conflicts have always driven technological advancements, be it missiles or drones. And that's no exception with Warplanet Online, the sponsor of this video. Warplanet Online is a real-time online strategy game played by over 100,000 players every month. In this game, there'll be only two sides, you and the other players from around the world in your alliance and those who will be conquered by you. To become the mightiest general, you need to build up your base and stockpile troops and equipment. And right before the battle, that's where your strategy comes in. Choose who you'll attack and the units that you'll attack with. And try the new and exciting offensive drones and the defensive mechs. You can even customize these units, so if you utilize smartly, they can give you an edge in the battle. And how can we not mention the lieutenants who'll be leading your army? Whether it's Wolfgang, Lady Winter, or Ayaka, the mech marvel of Noto will help you protect yourself with the humanoid robot mechs. Each character provides unique and special skills, and now you can unlock their level 1 for free, and cherry on top, they are immortal. Warplanet Online is free to play on all platforms including mobile and PC, so you can continue your progress seamlessly on multiple devices throughout the day. Enter the world of drones and exciting new lieutenants. Install Warplanet Online for free by clicking the link below or scanning the QR code on the screen. The Minuteman 3 could carry three warheads inside this re-entry vehicle, but the Peacekeeper could carry up to 12 MIRVs. In addition, the Peacekeeper was equipped with the Advanced Inertial Reference Sphere, which made its navigation much more accurate. This meant that even a small number of surviving Peacekeeper missiles could launch a sufficient retaliatory attack against the Soviet Union, with multiple warheads carried within each missile. But these improvements to the missile did not address the concerns about the vulnerabilities of silos against a first strike. 
In order to increase their survivability, each Peacekeeper missile would have 23 shelters, where the missile would be shuttled periodically. Because of the uncertainty as to which shelter contained the missile at any given time, the Soviets would have had to attack all 23 shelters to be sure of destroying that one Peacekeeper missile. This meant that the Soviets would have had to launch two or more missiles in order to neutralize one Peacekeeper, which was not feasible. The MX program was estimated to cost $50 billion, which is equivalent to $200 billion in 2023. Interestingly, only about 20% of that cost was for developing the Peacekeeper missile. The other 80% would be spent on building the shelters, transporter trucks and the overall deployment scheme. The project would also not be completed until the end of the 1980s, which meant the American ICBM force would remain vulnerable in the meantime. The missile development was approved, but Congress refused to fund the shelter idea. The missile base was still a point of vulnerability. To solve the base vulnerability issue, a number of mobile base solutions were proposed. For example, the Peacekeeper Rail Garrison. The idea was to put missiles inside rail cars that would be sent out into the US rail network during the times of heightened threat levels. If needed, the train could stop, raise the Peacekeeper canister upright, and within a few seconds, the missile was ready to launch. I should highlight that the Peacekeeper missiles were cold-launched, so the missile was first pushed out of its canister using gas pressure, and only once the missile had cleared the canister, its rocket motor would ignite to propel it on its trajectory. In contrast, the Minuteman missiles were hot-launched right out of the silo. Similar to Americans, the Soviets also had the ability to launch ICBMs from a train during the Cold War. I'm just not sure why North Korea is launching missiles from trains in 2021. Another mobile platform for ICBM launch used a smaller version of the Minuteman missile. They called it the Midgetman missile. The Midgetman only carried one warhead, making it smaller and lighter so it could be housed on a hard mobile launcher or HML. The HML was a radiation-hardened truck to transport the missile, but it could also plow the ground, and for a good reason. The plow allowed the trailer to dig into the dirt, creating a flat surface that would form a seal around the bottom. This way, a blast wave from a nearby nuclear detonation couldn't get under and flip the trailer over. Obviously, with a nuclear weapon on board, the HML was designed to gently handle ditches and rough terrain in order to keep the missile safe. It was of course equipped with an erector to launch the Midgetman missile when needed. The US military even attempted to bury and resurrect a Peacekeeper missile to see if they could hide it from Soviets and then bring it back in case of a nuclear apocalypse. The high-pressure water coming out of the mount was intended to clear the dirt from the launch tube. The first test flight of the Peacekeeper missile happened on June 17, 1983, which included the successful launch of six inert re-entry vehicles, with each one hitting pre-planned targets on the Kwajalein test range in the Pacific. But it was in the early 1984 that the fate of the Peacekeeper missiles were sealed. In the absence of a more feasible solution, a number of Minuteman launch facilities were going to be heavily modified in order to house Peacekeeper missiles. Starting with two silos, they were completely stripped off of equipment and reconfigured to accommodate the new missiles. One of the enhancements included a new missile shock isolation system to increase missile survivability inside the silo. This was extensively tested by Boeing, where foam block drop tests were designed to simulate silo wall motions during induced ground shock. To assemble the missile, the empty canister was first placed on a rotation fixture, which would facilitate the installation of shock absorbers and other components on the outside. The integrated canister was then driven to the launch facility. The canister equipped with shock isolation was then lowered into the modified Minuteman silo. The launch eject gas generator was then lowered. This enabled the cold launch of the missile by popping it out of the canister prior to the rocket motor ignition. Next, the missile stages were transported to the launch site, one by one. 
At the launch site, each component was moved from the transporter to the emplacer. The emplacer then carefully and slowly pivoted upright on top of the silo. Each piece was then lowered into the canister where the final missile was assembled. On December 22, 1986, 10 Peacekeeper missiles reached initial operational capability, and by December of 1988, all 50 missiles were in service. That's correct. At the end, only 50 Peacekeeper missiles made it into production. But why such a small number? In the 1970s, the major advantage of the ground-launched ICBMs over submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or SLBMs, was that the ICBMs had both the required punch and accuracy needed to target Soviet missile installations. SLBMs were not powerful or accurate enough. But by the late 1980s, when the Peacekeeper had finally become operational, next-generation SLBMs like the Triton II were becoming available and their accuracy was comparable to that of the Peacekeeper missile. In addition, since Trident II was submarine-launched, they didn't have the base vulnerability issues that Peacekeeper had been trying to address. It's worth noting that at some level, the US Air Force was competing with the US Navy to keep their strategic edge, and having 50 Peacekeeper ICBMs in service ensured that the Air Force still had a horse in the race against a Soviet first strike. But that horse race was short-lived. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 came the end of the Cold War. The arms reduction treaties that had been signed, like SALT and START, aimed to limit the development of strategic nuclear weapons to prevent an arms race. Demerving the ICBMs was one of these efforts, and the peacekeeper's neck was on the line. Plus, the Peacekeeper missile was far too expensive to maintain. For example, the cold launch system was quite maintenance heavy compared to the hot launched Minuteman 3. So the cheapest solution was to place some of the Peacekeeper warheads on Minuteman 3 missiles and phase out the Peacekeeper, which was done by September 2005. As of 2023, the Minuteman 3 remains the only land-based ICBM in the US arsenal and as for the Midget Man, well, it was cancelled too, for being too offensive of a weapon. <laughs>